Hello and welcome to SOCH 243A Criminology. I'm Professor Morin and I designed this course. Let's begin. To be upfront, this course is entitled Criminology, but I'm not really teaching you criminology. I'm teaching you why crime occurs. You need criminology to answer this question, but our real goal in this course is to teach you the answer to the question. Why do some people commit crime? Why is there crime in society? Why do some people continuously break the law? These are all really the same question put in different ways. This is the question or questions we'll be answering in this course. It might be a good idea to explain what we mean by criminology. Criminology is just one of many scientific fields that emerged from the 1500s onwards after what was known as the scientific revolution. Okay, well, what did the scientific revolution revolutionize? Or perhaps better, what did it replace? Prior to the scientific revolution, although people did practical things and new practical things, like if you put seeds in the ground at the right time of year, you will get corn. But all the ultimate questions, why and how corn could grow, why there was corn, and how we were around to eat it, let's say, were answered by the concept of God, or some version of spiritual or supernatural power. Human beings, also known as Homo sapiens, have existed for about 150,000 years, or let's say, 4,500 generations, give or take. For 4,300 generations, nearly all people believed that the ultimate explanations for things lay in the supernatural. This was also true of crime. People have hurt, killed, raped, poisoned, stolen from each other since the beginning of time, or to put it more scientifically, since we evolved. One of our oldest and most important books the Bible itself begins with a story of a brother murdering his brother. But for all this time, the reasons people did these bad things, if you look deep enough, were due to the influence of evil. In the Christian tradition, the devil. Things were more complicated, of course, but at the end of the day, the answer to murder, rape, robbery, etc. lay in the supernatural and the influence of evil. The supernatural as an ultimate explanation for the way things are began to be challenged when people began measuring the natural world in more precise ways. What do I mean? Well, this could start off without directly challenging the idea of God or the Bible. As better ships were built, for example, people went on longer voyages. To navigate in the open sea without any landmarks Navigators used the stars to steer their course. To do this, you needed more complicated tools for measuring the movement of and distance between stars. But you can still have God. But of course, with more accurate tools for examining stars, some people who are not sailors will eventually notice, and did eventually notice, some things that cannot be explained by existing ideas about the Earth and the Sun. For example, the stars sometimes move backwards in the sky. So one of the earliest and biggest ideas to fall to the new science and its concern with accuracy was the idea of geocentrism. Up until the 1500s, it was, it was just assumed the Earth was the center of the universe. The logic was as follows. God created the universe. God created man. Man is God's ultimate creation. Man, the ultimate creation, lives on Earth, and the Earth is the center of the universe. The sun and the stars go around us, with God beyond them all, looking down from heaven. Well, it turns out the stars do not move in the sky as if the Earth is the center point. It turns out that the sun, a star, is not moving around the Earth as if we were the center point. 
we are moving around it. You can only explain the weird things stars do in the sky by acknowledging that we move around the sun. So, we are not the center of the universe. Is the sun? Once you break with the idea that the earth is not the center, as we rotate around the sun, then you can easily start to think, well, how do we know the sun is the center? Maybe it's somewhere else. So God's ultimate creation is now not at the center of the universe. In fact, we don't know where the center of the universe is, but we know it's not where we are. You can see how a simple discovery of heliocentrism, that we orbit the sun, can bring about the collapse like a house of cards, all these other assumptions about the nature of the universe and the world that we took for granted has been obvious and unquestionable. So at base, the scientific revolution, the emergence of scientific fields such as astronomy, which we've just referenced, physics, chemistry, biology, and so on, was really about a new conception of truth. Truth was to be found by careful measurement, experiments, and gathering of evidence, not holy books, traditions, and ideas about what God thinks and wants. Criminology thus belongs to the science family, a fact you can immediately tell by the ology suffix, which indicates that it is a field of scientific study like psychology, sociology, neurology, and so on. But what is criminology? Very simply, it is a scientific study of crime. It is science's answer to the, to the question, why do some people break the law? Now this may disappoint some of you, but criminology is not forensics. It is a science of forensics that appears in many popular TV shows and movies, such as CSI, Criminal Minds, and so on. Forensics is the application of the scientific method, careful measurement, experiments, gathering of evidence and so on to the investigation of crime. Forensics is a whodunit field. That being said, there is a good deal of overlap between the fields of criminology and forensics, but explaining that is for another course. Criminology is not interested in who committed a specific crime but ra rather why there is crime, or more specifically, what processes lead to some people committing crime. There is another aspect of criminology that must be introduced. Most criminology examines the processes that lead to people committing crime, but focuses primarily on modern industrialized countries. Countries like America, Canada, England, France, Germany, Sweden, Greece, Australia, New Zealand, and so on. Let's add to this that crimes occur in much higher rates in cities than in towns and the countryside. We will take a look at why this might be towards the end of the course. Now, although I noted previously that science as a way of getting at the truth, what is really occurring, began to develop in the 1500s. It would take until the 19th century, the 1800s, for criminology to be born. Criminology is said to have begun in the 1830s. Why then? Well, it was then that states, that is governments, first began collecting reliable nationwide statistics on crime. France was one of the first countries to do this. Early criminologists noticed that there were patterns in the commission of crime. Crime was not random. Certain groups had distinctly higher rates of crime, namely young men with little education. This pattern of age, sex, and low social standing has been found in statistics on crime rates then and up until this day. Now, of course, people naturally would have feared people who look like this before crime statistics became available. 
but the availability of reliable statistics meant that people sensed that there were patterns or regularities in criminal behavior could now be confirmed by much stronger evidence than personal experience. And if something has a pattern, it can be explained. Criminology was born. Criminology has come a long way since the early 19th century, and we won't be covering all that occurred during this development between then and now. I'll admit, even today, there isn't much agreement about what causes crime among crim amongst criminologists, although the field is slowly moving towards an agreement. To end this short introductory lecture, I need to make one final but very important point. Crime statistics from modern industrialized countries all reveal a significant regularity. Let me explain. Take a look at this graph. Imagine you have 100 offenders and a total of 1,000 crimes committed. Now, naturally, you would think that each of these 100 offenders commits about 10 crimes each. 10 by 100 equals 1,000. That's not what's happening. In crime data after crime data, a different pattern is found. About five or six of these offenders commit over 50% of the crime. That is five or six of these 100 offenders themselves commit over 500 of these 1,000 crimes. That is, the majority of crime is committed by a small number of repeat offenders. It is this group, or how some people come to be in this group, that is the main focus of criminology, and thus this course. End of SOCH 243A Criminology Introductory Lecture